Thank you for that introduction. So good morning, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my my creative journey, really, because um, when Jen writes that all out, has written all that out, it, it was like, wow, 10 years. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I've got to where, where, where I am currently on my creative journey and share with you um, how I've managed to get projects off the ground. What I'm then going to do is um, we're going to have a Q&A session, so I'll be able to take some questions um, and find out anything that you may have. Now, I know with Q&As, you kind of think, oh, I don't really want to ask questions. So if you don't want to speak out in the group, that's fine. You can come and speak to me independently before the session finishes. So um, I've set, just recently started to set up a company called Arts Groupie. And the reason why that is, is I'm working on a community project in Liverpool 13 part time. And I have, I've been slowly edging my way out to um, setting up a company and going 100% on totally doing creative projects. But that hasn't been an easy journey. Now, if you're all from creative disciplines, you know it's very hard to make money in the creative industries. And it's taken me a lot of time to get up to this momentum where now I feel confident enough to be able to branch out. So Arts Groupie is a CIC and we're based in Liverpool. Can anyone tell me what a CIC is? Have you come across that term yet? <gasps> Tumbleweed time. Community interest. Community interest company. Right, so what that means, uh, has anyone come across that before? Yeah, okay, excellent. So a CIC is a community interest company, and what that means is that I'm gonna be doing arts-based projects for the community, and any profit that we make will go back into the business. So you can set up a CIC, as a safe way of generating income and a safe way of generating finance to then be able to hopefully eventually become a limited company um, when Arts Groupie makes a lot of money and I then have to think about branching out and taking on staff, etc. So at the moment, um, the emphasis is to produce theatre work and the arts because that's, it, it's a way that now I can start to apply for funding and various grants because I'm a CIC. As an individual sole trader, I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, it's gonna, uh, you'll notice on the slides, it's established as a community interest company in 2019. Well, the reason why that's happened is we've set up the community interest company in October, but what is now going on is that I've got a play called Kitty, Queen of the Wash House, which it has been funded by the Arts Council. So I've got that funding and there's a lot of money coming in from the Arts Council that needs to be managed in a audited, audited way. Now, when the play is on in March, I will then establish it as, I will then say it's now officially a CIC, which means that the Arts Council will be able to see that my journey has been helped by their funding, which it has. So hopefully then when I apply for funding again, they'll be able to say, well, this has been a, a stepping stone that he needs to get up, to, to get the business going. So I've produced seven plays to date, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about in a moment. But the reason why I'm going to tell you that about that is I'm going to tell you how I came about producing them while I was working full time because I had a full time job at the, at when they, they were happening. Um, and as I'm in the community in Liverpool 13, I'm based in a community hub for two days a week. I'm doing lots of stuff with, with older people and with young people. Um, so it's community arts. So what happened? I was working in John Moore's University as a trainer. I moved back to Liverpool in 2000. Oh, you can all tell I'm from Liverpool, yeah? No. I forgot to ask, <laughs> oh, is everyone okay with my accent? Yeah? <laughs> Because if you've been to Liverpool, I'm sure you know the accent is quite varied. And, uh, but I'm fortunate that I lived in Aberystwyth in Wales for several years. That's where I did my degree. Uh, does anyone know Aberystwyth? Yeah. It's a fantastic place, isn't it? It's beautiful. I was told once you graduate, get out of there because you'll never leave. It's like Twin Peaks meets the League of Gentlemen. It's a great little <laughs> place. Well, um, Aberystwyth was where I studied and um, I moved back. I lived in London for several years and then I moved back to Liverpool in 2008 when Liverpool just got capital of culture. 
Have any, did any, well, probably some of you weren't around in the 80s, but Liverpool in the 1980s was a dump. And I was told by my mum, get the hell out of Liverpool. Um, not that she didn't like me, but basically it was a case of there was nothing happening. So I ended up going to Aberystwyth, the university, to study drama. And then I went and was working in London. When I moved back in 2008, it was amazing. We'd had capital of culture, which meant a lot of funding from Europe came to help the infrastructure and celebrate the culture. So I originally was there for three months. Then I was going to move to Manchester, but I didn't. Um, I ended up staying. And I started to work in John Moore's University when it worked for a recruitment company, then was in the university. And I met a, a, lady, called, a lady called Joe Greenaway, who I call Tokyo Joe. She's from Walton, but she now lives in Tokyo. Okay, Tokyo Joe makes her sound like a gangster, which, is, which she always gets amused when I introduce her as that. She formed a magazine called 10 Minutes Hate, and it was an arts and political blog. But then um, the tsunami happened in Tokyo, and she ended up writing a book based on her experiences. And the book was quite novel because it was told through tweets and um, status updates from Facebook and Instagram and all these kind of things, all came together as a book and um, her website got bamboozled then because the book sold really well uh, the BBC featured it she then got pregnant and um, was really panicking because the um, magazine had like 5,000 6,000 readership a month but obviously she felt that pregnancy might stop her being able to you know she'd be able to write but not as regularly maybe as she could so she then employed me as a freelance writer and that's how I started uh, my portfolio career I was getting 80 quid for an article four articles a month which was quite nice on top of my job however and let this be a lesson to you all whenever you sign anything I always make sure there may be some royalty strands of the contract because that or now I don't write for that magazine as much as I used to but a lot of my articles are rehashed every year so when Grace Jones has a birthday a book review goes on when Frida Kahlo has an exhibition on an essay I wrote about Frida Kahlo goes on so it's great exposure for me as a writer and I get some paid gigs off the back of people reading it and my work getting out there but just let that be a lesson to you Always make sure, if you can, but you're in a catch-22 because you want to develop a portfolio of work. So you kind of think, well, I've got to take what I can. And um, the good thing is that I've written 385 articles for 10MH now. So I've always got that online. So it's, whenever I'm pitching to particular companies, I can always call on features that I've written. Um, Aberystwyth University spawned a lot of contacts for me. Um, what I'd say to you now while you're in university, you don't know where your friends are going to end up. You really don't know. These, these peers, your colleagues in your societies and your clubs and your halls of residence and in your different modules, you don't know what's going to happen to them in the future, good and bad. So keep in touch with people. To give you some scope, Aberystwyth University, I've got friends, one now, who's playing Mrs. Trunchbull in the West End and Torin in the uh, Matilda musical. Another one is, this is the irony, and I better not say that, actually. I'll, I'll leave that because it could get me into trouble. I've just remembered. <laughs> the other lady is um, the agent of Daniel Craig. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure she'd admit she wasn't the best actress, but she's now moved into agent agency work. So you just don't know. And one of my contacts works in um, a company called Actors Workshop. And now I get commissioned plays from him to be written. And that's just a contact from uni. So what I'm trying to say to you is that you think I don't have contacts in industry. Well, you've got potentially in your peers, your friends now, they are all going to develop their careers in various ways. And you never know when you're going to need to call on them. So my first play in 2010 came out called Heart, and I entered a competition. My granddad had just died, and my granddad told me, as I'm sure you may have heard from family members yourselves, the arts will not give you a stable career. You will not have um, make much money. He told me that I should be a police officer. I should move away from ideas of working in theatre. 
So when he passed away, I entered a competition with a play called Heart, and the play was about a man who finds the love of his life in bed with his best friend and throws up his heart. And then the whole of the play was a journey of where has his heart gone? Because in the, the middle of his girlfriend trying to explain her actions, he throws it up, she flushes the toilet, and the heart goes. And he goes into the sewer, he wanders around. It's a whole, whole, um, he eventually does get his heart back, but I won't spoil the end in case you ever read the, uh, the story or see the play. Now, um, I entered this for a competition in Liverpool called Right Now. And it was a, a competition to find new talent. And I purposefully, this is a bit cunning, but I, did, I didn't put it in under my name, John Maguire. I put it under my granddad's name, James Stewart, because I thought maybe if I'm meant to be writing, the universe or beyond might help me. And it might be my granddad in another realm telling me, actually, lad, I was wrong, which would be very rare because family members don't tend to do that. They're always right. Um, so this went on, and then that started my journey. I had heart. I then did a play called Weave, which has been commissioned to come back this year. This is about a Scouse girl with a possessed hair extension. Um, she has real Russian hair, and this was... I'm not against hair extensions. I don't use them myself, but um, it just fascinates me. My cousin, I was away for a week with her in Scotland, and every day she came out the bedroom my 16-year-old cousin, looking completely different. I thought we'd had a stranger in, because she had these whole array of hair extensions. And um, <laughs> she said to me, but it's a real Russian hair, Johnny. <laughs> and I was like, well, where has this hair originated from? Where's the origins? And that's what the play is about. It's, it's a comedy, but it's a dark comedy. And that did really well. Then I had a play called Bruise, which was about gay domestic violence. And that was picked up in Liverpool uh, by... Manchester Pride, and they gave us a couple of thousand pounds to take it to Manchester and put it on there, which was fantastic. And then a play called Porno Vision, which I don't have to tell you, you I'm sure you're all adult enough to know the title. It was about a man who had an obsession and ended up seeing the world in a certain way, which ended up putting him in an asylum. <laughs> kind of a moral tale. Um, and then I took a bit of a break. Um, 2013, I found that I was exhausted because I was doing plays around work and full-time in the university and it was like literally you know Confucius said choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day of your life well that's true but you know you still got to rest do your washing clean the fridge all that kind of thing so in 2013 I took a big step I'd been um I'd been I earned quite a lot of money in the university because it was a good job and the plays were ticking over but I thought, I need to really just go for it. So I did. And um, I took a year out. And in that year, I did some voluntary work with some charities. I did a gardening project, the Gorilla Gardening Project. And while I was doing all this, I was um, writing a lot more and reading a lot more. And that's the thing. If you want to work in the arts, you have to consume it. It's like if you're an athlete and you... Um, and you want to win a gold medal, well, you're not going to get that by going and doing the doggy paddle once a week in swimming to get a gold medal. You need to train. And part of the discipline of being an artist and being a creative is to make sure that you dedicate a lot of time to reading and whatever your medium is. If it's film, making sure you see quality movies. If it's, um, if it's, if, if it's literature, making sure that you read and you go and go to book readings, do as much as you possibly can. So I did this for a whole year, and then in 2016, the Lantern Theatre, where I'd been putting all my stuff on in Liverpool, they commissioned me to do a play called Hotel, which was about a hotel room. It had a talking bed, that was the narrator, and the, um, it was three different stories in the one hotel room. And that was really fantastic. We sold out for four nights, and they said, right, we want you to come back. We're going to pay you a massive fee. We want you to come back for a, a two-week run. And guess what happened? The Lantern Theatre, a nice 300-seater venue, got sold for student accommodation. So it never happened. So I was gutted. And um, I then found that I didn't have a lot of, you know, my savings were starting to dwindle. So panic stations now, because it's great that I was doing all the reading and writing and voluntary work, but I've still got to pay the, pay, pay the rent, you know? So I decided to get a part-time job 
and I went for a community engagement role for two and a half days a week, 20 hours, with this company called I Love My Club More, which is in, has anyone been to Liverpool 13 at all? It's quite a, quite a rough area. And um, My Club More was set up by Big Local. Big Local went around the UK and looked at all the areas that needed a lot of development, areas that needed to have um, uh, significant uh, financial boosts, areas that weren't applying for community grants through the lottery. So that's a good indication of that there's a not, not a lot of community activity happening if you're not getting heritage lottery or um, national lottery grants uh, applications from that area. So what happened then is I went for the job and it was that the, the area of being given a million pounds to spend over 10 years, but the residents are actually spending the money. So my interview was by the residents and it was the weirdest interview I've ever been to because, you know, you get told all this thing about how you should, um, uh, what are your strengths? What are your areas you need to develop? You know, how to describe yourself in three words, all that kind of, none of that. It was completely honest. The residents were brutal and some of them had never, ever interviewed anyone. Uh, so it was, a, it was the weirdest, surrealist interview of my life. And I walked out thinking there's no way they're going to give me this job. But they gave me it, which was fantastic. And we set up a little community hub in a disused retail unit where we're doing pottery, hip hop, DJing, yoga, um, line dancing, shared reading, loads of stuff. But what I'm able to do in them two days is I'm able to help with my creative skills. I'm able to use the skills to write features, blogs, all those things um, for, for that organization and still pay the rent and do the other theater and book work around it. Um, as well as uh, Clubmore, I've um, started to do history walking tours around Liverpool, which is a really nice job. It's a paid gig where you basically busking for three hours, you pay the company for every person they bring to you and then you do the tour for free and then they have to pay you. So it's a bit of a risk because some people will like, one guy gave me 40 pence on Saturday. I was like, really? I'll just give you three hours of my time. Um, I gave him it back, no, I'm <laughs> uh, But other times, uh, Americans are very, very rich and very, very generous because they're used to tipping. They give you 20, 30 pound. So if you've got 10 people and they all give you a tenner, you can do the math, it's quite lucrative. But the great thing about it is as a storyteller, I've been able to really develop my knowledge about Liverpool and test my material in the form that, I, you know, what plays I might want to do, etc. which has brought me on to my latest project, Kitty, Queen of the Wash House. Kitty Wilkinson was a lady in Liverpool who helped curb cholera in 1832. It nearly wiped out Liverpool. And um, none of the priests or doctors would go into people who had cholera just to give you some scope, if you had cholera, you were doomed. 24 hours, you'd be wiped out. Um, you literally, it wasn't a nice, nice, a nice way to go. You'd uh, <laughs> sickness from both ends and you'd turn blue. So you look like a really, really ill smurf, um, which isn't a good look to harbour. <laughs> now, what would happen then is Kitty went, started to go in and help the poor people that she, who lived by where, where she had her house. She decided to go in and um, start to get, encourage people to clean all the bed linen and all their everyday clothing items through lime and hot water. Now, she had a boiler in the kitchen, so she set up a one-woman laundry, which helped to stop the cholera. And her, her um, work didn't go unnoticed. The District Providence Society, they basically helped her by giving her donations of lime and um, money and she started to really really grow this laundry thing so that eventually the Liverpool City Council opened up a first ever public wash house and this is her story have any of you been to the St George's Hall in Liverpool yeah it's a fantastic venue isn't it well she's the only female statue in the St George's Hall the other guy, uh, 13 men, and all the men are all of the day. They're all like, oh, aren't we wonderful? We've done great things for the poor people from our ivory towers. Well, Kitty, her statue is on a plinth of bed linen, and she's rolling up her sleeves like, let's get stuck in. 
So the play is about her statue coming alive, telling her horrific life story because she had a terrible, poor life um, marked with tragedy. And her life story then, um, she did also had a happy time as well after the cholera. But the whole story is around getting people to think about, let's readdress this history thing because it's all his story, history. It's equally her story as well. So there needs to be more female statues in the St. George's Hall. And the end of the play, she actually, the St. George's Hall don't know this yet because they've, they've only seen part of the play. They don't know that at the end of the play, the statue kicks off and basically says, we need to have more female statues in here. Um, so hopefully that will lead to more being Elner Rathbone, Josephine Butler. It's on the 16th of March, um, but I have got flyers. <laughs> Here's, here's the plug. Now a word from our sponsors. I've got flyers, so I'll distribute them at the end as well. Um, so this play has come about through me doing the walking tours because I went through St. James's Cemetery and saw this grave. I was like, who is this lady? And then when I read up and did some bio biographical um, studying about her, I was amazed at her life story. And immediately I was thinking this would be a great play. So out of... My point is that you can create art and creativity from the everyday, from wherever you're, whatever you're doing, whatever you're working on. And um, I then did an application for the Arts Council. When I was in John Moore's University, I had to do loads of grant forms and loads of forms around um, careers, uh, grants to help people into employment and all this kind of work. So I took all that tool, that skill set, and I applied it to the Arts Council funding bids and we were successful. We were awarded £15,000 to put the play on, which is fantastic. It means that the, the actress and everyone can be paid properly as opposed to doing what happens in Liverpool a lot, which is profit share, which means you get like 10 pence out of the wash when everything goes, uh, pardon the pun, out of the wash. Um, so let me see if I can show you this trailer. I don't know if this will... Uh... Let me see... No. I'm sorry, I'm not... Um, I, they're not online. They're not online. Ah, yeah. Okay, so listen, what I'm going to do, if any of you are on Facebook, Instagram, look at Arts Groupie, Arts Groupie. Uh, if you can like it, I will be very appreciative, appreciative. But also, if you go on there, you'll be able to see a trailer. The trailer's fantastic, but... Um, yeah, my mum actually said to me, hey, lad, what happens if people come and see the play? The trailer's so good and they're dead disappointed. <laughs> I was like, well, thank you, mum. You have faith in my work. But it's a very good... Because the trailer's boss. It's done by a, a new company who've just come out of um, graduation in Liverpool called Avengers Media. And they've done all kinds of jiggery-pokery special effects. You can get... They're quite into the Marvel, the bit Marvel geeks. Not no offense if you like Marvel. I like Marvel, but these take it a bit too far. Hence why they call themselves Avengers Media. But I've just said that on on camera. I'm nice. <laughs> they, they won't watch this. They won't watch this. It's a compliment. It's a compliment. Um, what I want you to do now? Can we give yeah. them these? Uh, and you don't have to do this in the yeah. So let's see. Yeah, if you take one, pass it on. Basically, you probably all think, right, I've got no contacts within... I've, I haven't got a network of people, and I've got loads of... Um, I've got loads of... Uh, where do I start with contacts and whatnot? I told you at the beginning about how you need to remember the people that you're studying with now because you don't know where they're going to go. But everyone you work with or come into contact with, you never know what, what, how they can help in the future. So I'll give you an example. A lady called Stephanie Blundell works at the St. George's Hall. Many years when I first came back to Liverpool, I worked in a recruitment agency and I got this girl, Stephanie, a job in a really nice little... Um, a little um, role, and she is now the events manager of the St. George's Hall. So when I sent her an email, because she recognised my name, she then agreed to meet me. And when I then went to meet her, she said, right, I can't give you this uh, a discount, this hire of the hall, and it's a lot of money to hire it. 
But what I can do is because I know you and I know what, what you're, you're aiming to do, I'll give you a matinee and a main performance for the same price and I'll argue that with my department head. If she didn't know me, that would, would have just gone by the by. So my point being is you never know when you're going to use these contacts. So I've given you a sheet and I know, I think Jen will email it out to people or maybe as well. It's got a, um, it's all around how you think about your network. So think about your family members, think about your friends, think about your, oh, where's it gone? Think about your colleagues, um, personal, anywhere you've worked and start to write their names. And then next to the names, think about what they do. And before you realize, you'll, you'll know that maybe your, your friend's mum's auntie works in a studio in Manchester and you want to particularly go and work in that area. Use the contacts that you've got because you'll have a lot more than you expect because it is quite daunting. You think, how am I going to get anywhere in the beginning without knowing anyone? Well, you know a lot more than you realize. Okay. So... That's um, really what I wanted to talk to you, tell you a little bit about my journey and get you thinking about your contacts and your networks. Now, I know Jenny's got some questions.